Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you all to our virtual program here tonight, A Summer with the Crane Trust Fellows. We are just waiting for a few more people to log in. So thank you very much for joining us and we will be getting started shortly. And once again, uh, welcome to tonight's program. And as ever, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the comments and let us know where you're watching from. We also would love to know more about uh, why you're interested in the Crane Trust and if you've ever been here before to see the cranes or otherwise. We also invite you to ask questions. Uh, and so please leave those in the comments. However, we will be answering all questions at the end of the program. So please feel free to go ahead and ask them whenever you would like. We want to thank you all for joining us, and we are especially grateful for your interest in the Crane Trust. Uh, without people like you supporting the Crane Trust, the work we do here would not be possible. And so thanks again. And to kick off tonight's program, I want to invite Matt Fong to say a few words. So Matt, please take it away. Hey, thanks, Kylie, and thanks for organizing uh, this uh, this session tonight. Uh, it's so wonderful to see uh, folks log on and participate and have an interest in the continued work uh, of the Crane Trust. We are just so fortunate uh, to have and welcome uh, people like uh, Matt Urbanski uh, and Megan and Kahita uh, to our Crane Trust team over the course uh, of our uh, time with them. So some of them uh, are here for a longer amount of time or shorter amount of time, but it really is just a huge opportunity for the trust to be able to, uh, to welcome these uh, fellows and participants uh, into our work. Number one, it's great to be able to, uh, to work with young people and hope to inspire them uh, in their career path and for their continued work throughout their career. But also, to be honest, we would not be able to do all of our work without uh, some additional sets of hands. So we certainly uh, appreciate their uh, capable and willing uh, uh, hands and passion and enthusiasm for our work. Uh, and so certainly uh, appreciate them being here and participating in the life uh, of the Crane Trust. Uh, additionally, my uh, my title is Director of Fundraising and Outreach. And so I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention just uh, an enormous amount of gratitude that we have uh, for our donors and supporters who support uh, these types of initiatives in particular. Uh, so, so Matt serves as our Saunders Family Conservation Fellow, uh, and Megan uh, serves as our Lila O. Wilson Fellow. And so we are just so fortunate to, uh, to those families who have specifically uh, designated their dollars to support the work of, uh, of our fellows uh, over the course of their time with us. So certainly very grateful for uh, for their willingness uh, to support the trust in this really important way. So uh, again, I just uh, uh, thank you all for tuning in tonight. I know you'll uh, you'll feel uh, inspired and uh, grateful for uh, for the work of our uh, fellows over the course of the summer and uh, and the time that they have ahead with us. So uh, again, thank you for participating tonight. Thank you, Kylie, for uh, for organizing. 
And thank you so much, Matt, for being here tonight and for your ongoing support. Uh, Matt kind of helps us oversee everything that is with outreach uh, to include some of what we do here on virtual. And our virtual program is a six part program uh, featuring our cranes at during crane season. And that is our log longest program. And then we have several programs throughout the year, this being one of them. We usually run these through YouTube. And one of the uh, things we like to showcase is what goes on here at Crane Trust when people are, may or may not be looking. Uh, as many know, summer is a busy time here at Crane Trust, and there is a great many uh, variety of wildlife here to greet us. So I'm going to share a quick little video about uh, what's going on around the Trust when we are or maybe are not looking. So just bear with me, I am loading a video. Just bear with me really quickly. And so what you're looking at now is footage that we've captured during a uh, time out in the field. We have a pond that overlooks out where that heron was. And then we do have a number of bird species coming through right now as it is migration. Uh, this is a bird that we had on our live camera, a kingfisher. And so we have a variety of live cameras throughout the trust where we get to showcase all of the wildlife activity that goes on, but we also go out with our cameras in the field and capture footage as well. And sometimes we can bring that footage to you through our virtual programming, such as these bald eagles. And these birds migrating through, we've got uh, yellow-headed blackbirds, and here's another my bird that's here. I'm not actually sure what this bird is, but if you want to shout it out in the comments, we'd appreciate that. At sunset, our birds love to hang out in the cattails, and then we get a number of shorebirds that come through as well. And then, of course, our pelicans, which uh, often do join us in the spring with the cranes, usually later in the year. And uh, many people think they're seeing a white whooping crane out on the river when, in fact, it is a pelican. And this is our view from our river camera. And so that is a glimpse of some of the activity that takes place here around the trust. And it is a busy time for us. And so to get us warmed up for the rest of our presentations, uh, we would like to invite Kahita Barnoski, who joins us from the Pawnee Seed Preservation Society. And they've been involved. This is the second year in a row where they've had the opportunity to grow native corn here on Crane Trust property. Kahita is completing her graduate degree in agronomy and horticulture at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And Kahita, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, please take it away with sharing your screen with your presentation and feel free to introduce yourself.
All right. Can you see my screen? We can, Kahit. Thank you. Great. There we go. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, I'm Kahita Bernoski, and um, like she said, I work with the Pawnee Seed Preservation Society from Pawnee, Oklahoma. I'm also a grad student at UNO. And this year I was the only <laughs> uh, intern or worker we had up from the Pawnee Seed Preservation Society to come up to the Crane Trust and stay all summer and work on our, our Pawnee crops in Nebraska. Uh, last year we had a few interns, but because of funding and kind of time restraints, I ended up being the only one this year. Um, but first I kind of wanted to talk about how the seed project uh, is involved with the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma and how we got involved with the Crane Trust. Um, we all had a mutual ally that brought us together. Um, the Seed Preservation Society is actually a agronomy group uh, that works for the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. And through the mutual ally, we got in touch with the Crane Trust and are able to, to do little projects and have groups come up throughout the year um, to work on our own Pawnee agricultural projects. And so this summer, I've stayed all summer up in Nebraska. Uh, one of the biggest projects I'm working on is growing uh, Pawnee varieties of corn near the Crane Trust. Um, we had a lot of problems this year to start with, uh, a lot of germination problems. We had to go through about three different varieties uh, that the Pawnee used to grow. And we finally got some to germinate in mid-June. Um, and a lot of that is thanks to my mentor that lives here in Nebraska, Ronnie O'Brien, uh, who was a lot of help since I was the only Bonnie from Oklahoma up this year. She really helped me get the, the corn started and get, get them watered and continue growing throughout the summer. So as you could see, once we did get it growing, we had a really great germination this year. Um, we we grew some Pawnee corn last summer in four different plots, but since I'm the only one this summer, it was just one big plot. Um, we grew a bit more because uh, we were worried about the germination rate again. Um, so we ended up having to, to pull some as it grew and kind of thin it out because it really came up this year. Um, we tried to do it in the traditional Pawnee style with a sunflower uh, line around the, the plot of corn to protect the corn from wind damage uh, to stop critters like deer and raccoons getting into the corn. Um, usually the Pawnee to grow the corn in mounds, uh, but that would take a lot more work than just one person can handle. So we did grow them in rows uh, again this year. Um, but yeah, it looks pretty good. Um, the ears are still forming right now, uh, so we haven't harvested or anything yet. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of ears. Uh, I'd say about 75% of the, the crop is growing ears, which is pretty good for this type of variety. That's still kind of new to our tribe. Uh, I think this is our fourth year growing this, this variety. Um, so a lot of our Pawnee varieties come from uh, come from our ancestors that were passed down from family members um, and donated to the Pawnee Sea Preservation Society. So we are still learning a lot about these varieties and every year I get to come up to Nebraska and take notes on different varieties that different gardeners are growing. And then and now I'm finally getting to grow up myself in Nebraska where the Pawnee people are originally from. Um, I get to get to learn from this corn. It's really cool. Um, but I couldn't do it <laughs> without the help from the, the crane trust. They have been so helpful in getting like the mowing done, the tilling in the spring and helping us with the water. Uh, we're really out in the middle of nowhere trying to grow this corn, um, but they help us get a solar well, get a water tank, and some sprinklers going, uh, helps us with buffalo manure. Uh, we had to do a lot to the soil this year uh, and maintaining the pH and getting everything right for the corn to grow 
to grow well. So yeah, I really like to thank the Crane Trust for all that help. Um, so yeah, besides growing that plot of corn, uh, my other big project that I've been doing for several years now for the, the Pawnee tribe has been collecting data on these different varieties of Pawnee corn. Um, and as you could see from this little map, uh, a lot of our corn we get growing uh, from gardeners in Nebraska. Uh, we try to get people that grow around the rivers, um, some really good soil where the Pawnee villages used to really be around the central Nebraska along the rivers. And so that's where we try to find people to grow this corn for us in those areas. And um, so I travel to these gardens throughout the summer, uh, take data on the plants, you know, how it's growing, how long it takes to get to different stages in the corn's life, um, you know, measurements on how tall the corn is, different colors of silks, a bunch of fun stuff. <laughs> That's been helpful, um, not only for the tribe, but, you know, with my own research in uh, at UNL. And we've learned a lot just in the few years that I've been doing this. And it's helped us to, to figure out where these varieties are growing best. You know, like one variety might grow better in a drier area. Uh, so we look for not near a river, but where it rains less. Um, it's been a lot, a lot of help for, uh, for planning for the next year. But uh, all this data has also helped uh, the Pawnee Seed Preservation Society to protect our corn. And that's another big goal of the Pawnee Seed Preservation Society is to figure out how to legally protect this corn and that's where all this data is going towards is to to legally protect these varieties of Pawnee corn and if you want to learn more about the Pawnee Seed Preservation Society or the crops we're growing we have a Facebook page that we update regularly like almost daily and you can learn everything there is to know from that Facebook page um, so yeah that's the two big projects I've been working on this summer um, and I'll continue working on it until my crop is ready to harvest. So well, yeah, in a September, beginning of October, I'll be finishing up here. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kahita. Uh, we did have a quick question about corn. Uh, how would okay. you, how would you say, uh, Pawnee corn differs from commercially grown corn? Oh yeah, it differs a lot since um, this corn hasn't been, um, you know, messed with or <laughs> touched. Um, like commercial corn has, this corn resembles um, closer to to where all corn comes from, to, from Teosinte. So it's more bushier. Uh, we get a lot of variation, not like uniform look like commercial corn has. Um, we'll start to see things when the corn will revert back to um, to older styles of corn. We'll see kernels growing on the tassels, uh, silks growing out of the tassels as well. We'll see different colors um, in the leaves and in the stalks. So there's a lot more variety to look at in these types of corns than in the commercial corns. Thank you so much. Uh we really appreciate you being here, Kahita, and you're welcome to stay with us until the end of the program. Otherwise, um, if you have to go, we totally understand, but thank you so much. We really uh, appreciate that presentation. And it is very interesting to learn about uh, the, the varieties of corn that used to grow here and, and could still grow here with, with some work and diligent effort. So kudos to your work and uh, please, we hope to see what, what happens at the end of this season and uh, next season as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're moving on to our next presenters. We have Matt Urbanski and Megan Sladaki here who have been our fellows throughout the summer. Uh, Matt Urbanski is our Saunders Family Conservation fel fel Fellow and he's going to talk to us about his experiences here 
Uh, Matt studied wildlife biology at Hastings College and graduated this past May. He enjoys documenting wildlife with cameras and has been an important part of our online content creation this summer. And if you've been following us on Facebook, you've probably seen some of his wonderful content. Megan Slodatke is our Lila O. Wilson fellow, Wilson fellow, and she joins us to present on uh, a variety of other surveys that we've done throughout the summer. Megan went to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in fisheries and wildlife, and she's very passionate about the wildlife here as well as conserving native species. And so to get you started uh, with the presentation, Matt will be going first and then they will transition into a joint presentation along uh, and then Megan will follow with a presentation to conclude. We will have a few videos to, uh, to intervene with some of the presentation time. But I want to first off have you imagine stepping into the prairie on a warm breezy day and wandering into a slough that's home to a forest of cattails. You wade through the murky water and your sandals uh, grass the tiny fish beneath. The air is sweet with grass but as you tread you kick up a faint smell of sulfur. This is the environment we all experience when we go in to look and study for fish. And we, were, we are sharing a clip on fish signing for you. And Matt is going to describe a little bit of what we're watching as we watch it together. So just bear with me as we load up the video. Awesome, as the video loads up. Hi everyone, I'm Matt Urbanski. Uh, I'd also like to say thank you to Kylie for putting this whole virtual together and giving me a nice introduction. Um, and by the way, great. Um, Great presentation, uh, Kahita. <clears throat> it was really cool to see what you're working on and get a little bit of a deeper dive into it. Thank you. So here we are just uh, seining, have two scarers and two on the same net, pushing as many little minnows and other fish into the nets as possible so we can grab them, count them, identify what species they are in order to collect data. That's a cool shot. And so sorry. I think that's a, oh, too fast, that's okay. Might've been a stickleback, I couldn't tell, let's see. But yeah, this is literally what we'll do the whole time, just grab handfuls of these fish, write down, have a, whole, a recorder writing down what we find. There's me right there, <laughs> recording what we find. And if we are perplexed on what the fish is, uh, with that visual right there, we will grab our little um, laminated sheets of fish identifying paper and figure out what it is. And so this process repeats how many times? Um, I think it's um, usually six or seven times that we, we repeat this in a day in one slew. And how long does it take uh, to spend a day on Fishy Friday out in the field researching the fish? Oh, that's a good question. I would say, so we usually start at 10. I think it probably takes a good two, three hours to get uh, the six or seven done. But yeah, it's a lot of fun. You get into the muck. If you enjoy being dirty, if you like being feeling squishy stuff between your toes, it's great work. And these are all rough cut so, videos that we will um, be stitching into small uh, segments with interviews uh, later down the road here for virtual. So thank you, Matt. I'm gonna let you share your screen and take it away for us. Awesome, thank you, Kylie. All right. I think it's loading. Give me one second. Ah, there it is. Okay. 
Can you see that, Kylie? The fish slew monitoring data data sheet. Yes, I can. Yes, that's great. Awesome. Thank you. So this right here is what in the video I was writing down on. As you see, it says fish species. So you write down the species, their specific code, which usually is just like the first uh, two or three letters of like, so if it's a plains top minnow, it's like PLTO, plains top minnow. Um, but there's way more that we're looking at than just the fish. We're also taking measurements of how much oxygen is in the water, what the pH of the water is, or how acidic the water is. We're looking at the organic material, the temperature, the gravel and sand percentage in the in the uh, sediment. And let's keep going. So the main goals of these fish surveys is to monitor the condition of select permanent uh, water, warm water sluice wetlands, since they are crucial to whooping cranes and a variety of migratory birds. And that's what we're here for. We're here to help protect the cranes and make sure that they have a solid habitat to roost in and travel through. So fish are also a key indicator of aquatic ecosystem health. We can also track the abundance of native state listed small body fish like the plains top minnow and see how it's doing and track it over time while also looking at something like a, a mosquito fish, which is a little tiny minnow looking uh, fish with a big, big bulb bulbous stomach. And that one is actually invasive. And we can see how those invasive fish are doing in comparison to our um, native species. So we can also examine the response of the fish communities to different riparian management actions and grazing regimes and track slew condition and fish community compositions in response to hydrological variation. So depending on how the river is higher or lower, it affects how high the sloughs are. And if we have a dry year, we can see how that affects the fish. And if we have a wet year, we can see how that affects the fish as well. See if the higher, higher water levels do anything. And by looking at these different management actions, we can then decide what should we change next year? How can we be better in the next years? So my next part of my presentation is breeding bird surveys. So what we really do is we travel to different monitoring plots throughout the property at, of, at the Crane Trust. And Bethany Ostrom, our wildlife biologist, will do these bird surveys and me, and me or Megan will follow her and take notes and write down the specific things that we see. So right here is a Western meadowlark. So she'd be like with her binoculars on, oh, there's a Western meadowlark and I would write that down, one Western meadowlark. A Northern bobwhite, another bird. <laughs> and then it would just keep going, however many birds there are. So this right here was what I'd be writing on. I would be writing in the point, uh, well, I'd be writing the species down. Uh, I'd be writing how many are inside or outside of 50 meter length. And then if there's any like specific or interesting things that we see, like two herons like playing, hanging out, we could put that down. Uh, a bald eagle eating a fish on the river, we could write that down. Or a red-tailed hawk being attacked by, I believe, an eastern kingbird and being chased <laughs> by a red-winged blackbird. So the goals that we have set or the goals of this is to identify a variety and identify the variety and relative abundance of bird species across the crane trust property throughout time and in a variety of habitats on the property. So spatial distribution and seasonal variation of the birds is something we watch out for. We make sure we have good data on. We assess the impact of various management techniques on the avian communities. Again, uh, so we can be better in next year. We can change our management plans to uh, create a more balanced ecosystem. We can also identify any shifts where we aim to identify any shifts in bird migration and nesting patterns as a result of climate change, habitat fragmentation, and habitat change. And with those things, uh, we might have, as those things like progress, like climate change or the habitat fragmentation or habitat change in general, we might have to change our management techniques. My next slide is about our bison fecal parasites. 
so in bison in our bison bison fecal parasite work, we go out and we collect this right here, this bag of, you know what, <laughs> it's great stuff. Um, but we'll take it, we'll do a whole bunch of steps. Basically, we will uh, mix all, mix up the poop and we'll get the, the pe a pellet down to the bottom using a centrifuge and getting this uh, filter right here is to get all the big chunks out first. We'll go in that cup. We'll put it in here into a, uh, a tube thing. I don't remember what they're called. But yeah, we'll fill it up with water, put in the centrifuge, mix it up, get it all the stuff to the bottom. And then we'll repeat that process pretty much. But in the second time, we'll put a solution that will cause all of the little pieces of the parasites and other like uh, organic, tiny organic matter to float to the surface. So then we can put in more of that liquid, which is a sheath or solution and make a slide. So when we make these slides, as you can see, I'm looking right here, we look all the way through, we go in a zigzag pattern all the way through these slides and we count every single parasite that we find. Um, and there's five main parasites that we're looking for. So as you can see here, we have, uh, this is what the data sheet would look like. So we would write down the bison tag, like what, which bison are we looking at? Um, just so we don't mix up the poop. Because if you are looking at specific parasites of a specific bison and you mix it up, it's just not good. Um, but yeah, we'll put right there the which bison it is, how much of the poop we, uh, we measured out. Because at the beginning, we'll measure out five grams. And then we'll mix it up and filter it and do all the other steps. But then, yep, as we look through, look through the poop, we'll look for strongyle, trichuris, nematodiris, monesia, and some others. So our goals in, in this is to monitor our herd in case of some type of an outbreak and if we needed to do some type of intervention, which we don't right now. It sounds like they started out, or there's studies where they gave bison um, some type of medicine. I don't know what the right term is for the medicine, but a medicine that helps prevent parasites. And what they found was it actually worsened the bison's conditions and made it so their, their immunity to these parasites was lower. Um, so what ended up happening was they stopped giving them this medicine. And what they found is the small, the younger, younger uh, calves, they will have a higher parasitic load. And as they get older, they'll become more and more immune. And so they have very few parasites in comparison to when they're younger. So using that medicine actually harmed them. Um, so something else we are looking at with this uh, data we're collecting is, do cows and calves have more or less parasites? And when I say do cows or cow with cat, oh, sorry, do cows with calves have more or less parasites? So the mother, if the mother has more parasites, does the calves, does the calf have a lot of parasites? And when it grows up, is it going to have the same amount as the mom? Could it have more or less, you know, depending on the father? Um, what do their baby parasite loads, uh, what do their baby's parasite loads look like in comparison? I pretty much just said that, but yeah. And next, I believe Megan will be joining me for moth exploration. All right. Yeah, I'm Megan. I'm the other fellow here at the Crane Trust. Um, so last year they did do uh, conduct some very thorough uh, and procedural moth surveys to look at the species we have here on our property. Um, however, they weren't doing the formal process this year, uh, but me and Matt wanted to still go out and see these uh, different species. So we went out late one night, um, at around just right at dusk, right when it was getting dark, uh, set up a big white sheet and just collected a bunch of different species of moths and took pictures of them. Yes, it was super fun. Megan was a sport because I was, I was sitting there taking pictures. She was collecting moths, bringing them back. It was a lot of fun and I couldn't have had fun uh, taking these photos and just hanging out. 
um, seeing all these different species of moth moths without Megan's help. But yeah, so if you're wondering the, how we attracted them uh, was we put up kind of a big uh, white sheet, um, kind of, yeah, just like straight up. And then we had lights shining on it and it just attracted the moths. And something cool about moths is different wave, wavelengths of light will actually attract different moths. And we didn't mess around with that that night. And I don't know if we have uh, have the lights for that for that capability, but I think that'd be really cool to look into. Yeah, we found a bunch of cool little guys. Uh, unfortunately, neither me or Matt or uh, have good eye moth identification skills, so we don't know what species we found, but they all look pretty cool. So, yes. Oh, you know what this one is, though. I think. Oh, we do know what this one is, though. Um, yes. As I say that, I am blanking on. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, the hummingbird moth. Oh. I don't remember the scientific name. Shame on me. But. <laughs> Yes. And then I think this is our last one. And that will bring us to vegetation surveys. Yeah, I'll just go ahead and talk a little bit about the procedure and how we would do that. Um, so we have a bunch of monitoring plots all over the Green Trust property. Um, so we essentially do uh, a 200 meter line or transect. Um, uh, and we are kind of just go, we stretch out a nice meter, uh, or sorry, it's a hundred meters, a hundred meter, uh, tape measure, uh, what, uh, Josh in the, uh, light plaid shirt is running across, uh, just so that we can have a nice straight line, uh, to keep things, uh, neat so that we can compare to other years. Uh, so once you've got that line, we do two separate kind of surveys. We do a uh, point line transect, a point line and a quadrant. Uh, so that first picture on the upper left is Josh walking through and every um, meter he's kind of sticking a or sorry, I think it's every five meters. He is sticking a, a piece, like a long stick or something down right at that meter mark. Um, and he is uh, telling me the code of the vegetation that he's hitting. Um, and he'll do that throughout the 100 meters. The second one is a quadrant. So every 25 meters, he's got a nice um, square that he drops down on the vegetation and that one will give us more of an idea of um, cover percentage. Um, so he'll also give me codes for all the vegetation, um, but then we'll, he will also give me a percentage for how much of that area they're covering. So that gives us a little bit better idea of uh, what things are down lower and what things are like taking up more space. I'm just gonna say one thing before we keep going. Um, but this this survey right here, this one is a doozy. It's a lot of fun, it's a lot of work, and it's really cool to see all the different plant life, uh, especially with the different topography and uh, habitat types. But we have to write down every single plant that he finds at each of these little little sites when he does the the quad. So there's 10 quads along the line, as Megan said. And we have to write down every single plant that he finds. And then we have to make sure uh, to write down like the percentage that that plant takes up of the quadrant. And it just takes a lot of time and effort. And it's really, it's, it's fun, but it's challenging. Yeah. Uh, so I'll let Matt talk about the goals of this study. Cool. So the goals of our vegetation surveys are to see the effects of our management op options. So should we be burning? Should we be haying? Should we rest an area? Should we uh, let cows graze? Should we let bison graze? Because bison graze a lot differently than cows. Cows will mow down a whole area and bison will pick and choose a little bit more um, and leave patchier areas still fully grown. So we also understand that long-term changes 
in vegetation communities are <clears throat> or as a result of vegetation success. Oh, let me re-say that one. Let me re-say that one. So we also understand that long-term changes in vegetation communities as a result of vegetation success and global climate change. Oh, I got you, I got you. I read it weird in my head. So <laughs> understanding the long-term changes in vegetation communities as a result of vegetation success and global climate change is what we are gathering from this information and helping us have a more solid group of plants that can withstand uh, all of the challenges that our earth is facing right now. And this right here is just something I kind of added on to the, the vegetation survey <clears throat> uh, PowerPoint. But this right here is a prairie fringed orchid. It is a very rare plant that will actually supposedly grow on Crane Trust property. And me and Megan had the pleasure of going out and walking some transects in order to see if we could find it this year. Sadly, we didn't find it, but I thought it's a really cool plant and we should share it with you guys. But from here, I think this slide is done. Um, thank you. All right. And so I believe at this point, Megan is going to share more surveys with us. Uh, one of those surveys yes. is a small mammal survey. And I'm going to play just a clip of video for us to, to watch together as she kind of describes what's happening. So. Here we go, Megan. So we have small mm -hmm. mammals survey. Of course, it takes preparation to set up. Can you just tell us a little bit about how you prepare? Yeah, so uh, with the small mammal surveys, we do a 200 meter line transect this time. Um, so much like the vegetation survey, we start at uh, the uh, specific point and then we go out 200 meters. Every five meters, we set a trap. So you can see Matt doing that right here, where we open the trap so that the trigger is ready and we put seeds in there to entice our small mammals, our nocturnal small mammals to uh, go inside for the night uh, so that we can find them in the morning. Um, it is a kind of a lengthy process, especially that first night. Um, and they might go in just like this. <laughs> So you can see that we have our own kind of seed mix as well as mealworms that we have in there because we do get shrews and shrews are car carnivorous and they are they're insectivores. So uh, the next so morning then, you go back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just saying the next morning good. you go back out. Yep. The next morning we go back out. And if you were, if a little mouse was caught at night, this is what they would see that next morning. Um, there is an example of something we would catch. Um, and then so we take a nice big plastic bag, put it over the entrance, get the bag, get the trap a little shimmy so that the mouse falls nice and safely into that clear plastic bag. Um, we do close it at times just to prevent any uh, escapees, but they are never closed in there long enough uh, for any harmful effects. Um, so there's me writing down uh, the code for that species. And they get a very gentle release, sometimes not a planned release, like this one here. Uh, we try to let them down on the ground, and sometimes they have other plans. Uh, but, Thank you so yeah. much. So now I'm going to let you, Megan, share your screen so you can walk us through the rest of your presentation. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, small animal surveys. Um, so yeah, I kind of went over this briefly while we were talking over the um, video, but uh, I have we have we use two 100 meter measuring tapes that we run um, from the start 
of the transect to try to be in a, a straight line as possible, again, for just uh, re repeatability and keeping things at a standard. Uh, every five meters goes a trap with our own uh, seed mix that contains like sunflower seeds and whole oats um, and the uh, dehydrated mealworms, as I mentioned. We set them about to an hour to two hours before sunset, um, just so that we don't catch, it lessens our chance of catching any uh, daytime little critters. Um, but it's also to make sure that if they do get trapped before nighttime, it's not gonna get hotter in the day. It's only gonna cool down. Uh, so again, just keeping them as safe as possible. Uh, so why are we trapping these guys? Uh, so we're trapping them uh, because it's been noted that small mammals um, are particularly sensitive to any kind of landscape changes and grazing changes. So one of the things we're looking at uh, is to see if there's a difference between having bison in a field versus cattle and how that kind of changes that dynamic. Um, they're also a very important uh, prey item for our birds of prey, so our falcons, our uh, hawks, eagles. Uh, they're also a prey item for the cranes. Uh, so we also want to make sure that uh, we are maintaining our landscape for those species to be here as a food source. Um, here is just an example of some of the little guys we caught. So going from left to right, um, at the top left, we've got a deer mouse. Um, the top uh, right, we've got a meadow bull. And then going down on the left is one of our little shrews, our insectivores. And then on the bottom right is a jumping mouse. So another survey I'm going to talk to you guys about is our anurin surveys, uh, which I very much enjoy. Uh, so anurin is essentially frogs. Um, so what we do is we go out to a site, at, uh, we follow a set procedure of about 30 minutes after sundown. We go to one of our sites and we just sit and listen quietly for five minutes um, and listen for their distinct uh, or species distinctive uh, calls that they make. And we rate the choruses that they're doing on a scale of one to three. Uh, it's a good key for more of a, abundance. Uh, so one being there's only one uh, or there's very few individuals and we're not hearing any overlap. Two is we're hearing some overlap, but there's some quiet spaces. Three is there's no, uh, it's all overlapping. There's no distinct individual calling. And then we also try and approximately count how many individuals we're hearing. Um, so why are we looking at listening for frogs at night? Uh, if they're a huge food source for cranes. Uh, specifically, our boreal chorus frogs are a big prey item for our whooping cranes. Um, and also, they are also a species that are sensitive to pollutants, to environmental changes. Um, so it's a good, I, a good key of how our water bodies are doing. So here are some of the species that we heard. So again, moving from left to right. We've got our woodhouse toads, then our boreal chorus frogs, bullfrogs, uh, plains leopard frog, and copes gray tree frog. All right, and then, um, so those that's really fun. Um, we typically do that 30 minutes after sundown and uh, we try to stop or be done around uh, midnight. So it is a later night protocol, but I really enjoy it. It's quite fun to listen to them. Um, and you hear a lot of other things at night, such as coyotes. And last but not least, I'm going to talk about our butterfly surveys, which are kind of going on about right now. We actually just finished them up today. So we 
To do those butterfly surveys, it's also uh, walking a transect, but we have 15 minutes to walk from point A to point B. And there's also rule, uh, roles associated with the people walking them. So we need to have an observer. We need to have someone with the GPS giving directions. We need a data recorder um, and a timekeeper. And usually there's only two people out doing the survey, so we split those roles up. Um, we also ID any plants that the butterflies land on, uh, just so that we know what they're going for. So the reason we're doing this is because there's been a general decline in butterflies, um, but we're also looking at the regal fritillary and the monarch butterfly. So the monarch butterfly is pretty much the poster child for pollinators. Um, but, I mean, they're very important pollinators and their populations still aren't quite stable. So we want to just keep monitoring them and seeing what they're doing. Regal fritillaries are um, kind of almost, they're kind of teetering on the edge if they're going to be um, a species of concern or if it's something or uh, we think they're fine. But until that gets determined, we also like to just keep an eye on them. So on the top, top two pictures, we have the regal fritillary. Um, they are very distinctive with their rows, two rows of white spots on the bottom of their wings. And then of course we have that monarch butterfly on the bottom. And that concludes my slides. And I believe Kylie has a video to share. Yes, I do. Thank you so much, Megan. That was lovely. And to uh, conclude with our formal presentation tonight, I want to share a butterfly video with you all. And just let it open. And so in an unassuming plot of ground in front of where we stay here at the Crane Trust, there are many wildflowers that grow. At first glance, uh, you may not notice much, but spend some time and you will begin to see and discover a world of butterflies. These flowers are growing from, if you're standing as an insect, very tall. So to something like a butterfly or even a field mouse, these would be towering mountains of flowers and the butterflies do love them. These are monarchs. This footage was taken across the last 48 hours and they are absolutely loving this spot. Uh, and the reason I bring this to your attention because if you too grow wildflowers in your gardens, you may attract monarchs who are currently migrating. Uh, they're on their way to Mexico. They take several generations to actually migrate from the north to the south. And right now they're right in the midst of the crane trust. We have other pollinators as well to include hummingbird moths. That's that moth that was described earlier by Matt and Megan. We also have bees and there's several varieties of bees that join us. We've had a very lucky year with our pollinating plants. It's been very moist. And so many of the wildflowers are quite thick this year and the monarchs are absolutely loving them. Monarchs are also very hard to photograph and film. Uh, they are also hard to observe on windy days, which is why uh, when we're doing our butterfly surveys, we usually have to wait for a pretty still day to do the surveys. So if you have any questions about monarchs or other pollinators, please feel free to drop them in the comments. And thank you so much for watching. So at this time, we have a few minutes left uh, to review some of the questions uh, you have all asked. We've got Matt and Megan live, so I'll just start going through the questions. If they've been um, answered in the comments, I'll go ahead and read what those are, and if we have time, we can expand on them. But let's start with, uh, in the Q&A section, somebody asked, are there any fish species uh, that we're on the lookout uh, 
for like with the whooping cranes. So I'm assuming either we're talking about fish species that our whooping cranes are attracted to, or do we mean uh, fish species that might be extinct? Um, maybe we could answer to both of those. Uh, Matt, do you have an answer to that on our fish surveys? Yes. So, so the plains top minnow seems to be a fairly rare minnow and a, a either a species of concern of concern or, or I think I, I can't remember if it's a species of concern or danger. I think it's just a species of concern right now, but I that's one that we are watching. Um, for sure that every time we see one of those all everyone that has their hands deep in the buckets looking through the fish is like yes we have a plain stop minnow and everyone's super happy but uh, sticklebacks and shiners and others are also very welcome anything native we're happy to see excellent and then uh, do you know do you happen to know matt do uh, whooping cranes eat eat fish here at crane trust oh Maybe we don't have I've, anything to do that. I believe, I believe so. Yeah. I believe so. I'm not not an expert yet. I'm I'm still learning and, and I'm enjoying learning at the at the crane trust, but I believe they would, because I mean they eat invertebrates and all that stuff. So I don't see why they wouldn't eat a fish because they eat frogs and everything else. Awesome. And then uh, we did have a question about the safety of the fish while we're fish signing and does it hurt the fish? And I can see Matt that you wrote while signing, it is pretty safe for the fish. They can get tangled. Um, we can push them through the net. So you don't try to pull them and you try to take care. Do you want to expand a little bit on that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, most fish, they're very streamlined and they're trying to go really fast this way. And if they get eaten um, from the back, as many fish do, you know, they have the spines and everything as a defense. So when they get stuck in the net, if you try and pull them out, all their spines would get stuck on the net and you could tear them apart. So you don't want to do that, obviously. Um, so we'll push them through the net and uh, get them through, put them out. Um, but um, I'm sure you saw us like sometimes dropping them into the water. Uh, we try not to like chuck them, throw them. We try to be nice to the fish. Um, <laughs> I would never throw a fish into water like that. Um, but I think it's very, very important to keep the, the fish's safety in mind and respect nature as we do this. Absolutely. And I mean, I see you all being careful with even the plants and the uh, other species, and we all take a lot of care to go out and we're using trails instead of driving uh, into the raw pasture. We're just really trying to tread as lightly as we possibly can as this research is ongoing uh let's see what other questions we have thank you so all to add on that real fast oh sure uh, there are some species that are more um oxygen sensitive so uh, when we have them in the in that big white bucket we usually have to be very conscious of what species we have in there um, because with a lot of species in that small little bucket they can de deplete the oxygen quite quickly um, but both our wildlife biologist uh, and Josh uh, Weiss uh, know which species to watch out for, and we make sure to get them out of that bucket as quickly as possible. So um, while we've been saying I haven't seen really any fatality from our doing, I should say. That's really great to hear. And also with the mammals, I know we're all very careful, so that's really good. Uh, so we had a question, uh, when do other birds nesting and migration behavior occur in relation to cranes? Um, I, I could answer this a little bit if, if you want me to, uh, just because what happens during crane season at the very end of crane season, we start to get our migratory birds that are going to nest here. They start arriving around that time uh, as the cranes are passing through. And, but usually later is when we get our nesting cranes, like I would say later in crane season. So uh, late March, early April, just from what I've observed. But uh, Matt, you, uh, you were also answering that question. I think um, either of you can answer, feel free. Um, if you wanna expand on it. Sure, I'll, I'll go for it. Uh, I just kind of give a broad answer. I know there's many birds that that nest at very different times. 
Um, but from from my knowledge base, I know from early to mid spring, usually until like um, mid to late summer, and then they start to not really have any more any more nesting behavior. That's true. And they're getting ready to leave us now, which is kind of sad. All right. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, are there any of the Crane Trust Prairie completely virgin? And if so, what, what percent? And I think uh, we did a great uh, analysis of that in the comments as well. That's actually a really good question for Josh. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I would assume a very small percentage is virgin we have or untouched uh but we've i know the crane trust has done a lot to uh uh turn things back to native prairie but very little untouched land yeah i think the statistic i know a is a little that... chunk of cool stuff but <laughs> yeah sorry oh no worries no worries at zoom uh, the statistic that um, that I learned actually at the Willa Cather Prairie is that 40% of North America was once prairie, and of that 40%, 98% has been appropriated for other purposes outside of preservation. So only 2% remains intact and untampered with. So it's a pretty small number. If we were, you know, thinking about th those numbers from a, a more global, you know, 3,000, 300,000 square foot view of the world that would be what you could what you would learn at willer cath prairie any other questions do you know thank you all by the way for your kind comments and we all appreciate you being here tonight we have a question do you know about touch the sky prairie located near minnesota that i i don't know about that victoria uh, have either of you heard of that? Kahita, have you heard of that? Uh, no, I have not heard of that. Yeah, Feel free to jump in too if you have any commentary about prairie or native grasslands, anything like that. Anything we're talking about. Okay, so it is a project of the photographer Jim Brandenburg. I'm going to just stay live for a few more minutes to have more questions answered. And while we wait for more questions, I'm actually uh, looking at uh, where that is, because we're actually going to Wisconsin this week to celebrate the International Crane Foundation's 50th. And um, if, if I can pass through there on my way, uh, Matt and I are going from Crane Trust. So if I can pass through there on my way, I'm going to check that place out, uh, Victoria. So thank you so much. Uh, and Linda has asked us to remind everyone, yes, we have a potluck on October 10th here at Crane Trust in the Nature and Visitor Center. It will feature uh, the Pawnee Seed Preservation Society with Ronnie O'Brien, and she will be talking a little bit about uh, what that work is. And hopefully, um, Kihita, if you're not here, maybe you can tune in. All right, Kihita, will you be attending for that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll at least be awesome. um, helping Ronnie behind the scenes for that. That's great to hear. So if you have, if you think of any other questions between now and then, make sure to uh, save them for that night. Uh, this presentation has been recorded as you've all seen. So it will be available to you on YouTube uh, within the next two weeks. So we'll get that up and going for you live and feel free to spread the word. I'm gonna just leave it for one more minute on any more questions. I think I see one more question. And the question is, is milkweed the best plant to help and oh. attract monarch butterflies? That's a really good question. What do you all think? It's a good one. Yeah, it is a good one. Um, I, th I think it's a, a very important plant to have around since they rely on it to reproduce. They lay their eggs on milkweed. 
Um, but if you really want to attract monarch butterflies, I think you need to have a good mix of native pollinating uh, pollinator plants, so flowering plants, and have some uh, have a variety that will bloom throughout the season in your yard so that they have a, a solid space to be around. And if you can encourage your neighbors too to also have some pollinator plants growing, it'll be a great little belt of flowers that they can follow and move around through. Yeah, you said it. I was going to add the whole um, make sure they're blooming all year round thing. You, you got that covered. So that is great. Um, all right. Any final words from our panelists before we close out for the evening? Uh, I just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you, Kylie, for putting this all together, including your, your amazing footage. Um, thank you, Matt, for other Matt, not me, other Matt, I'm not thanking myself. Uh, thank you for uh, having a little introduction at the beginning and being here. Uh, thank you, Tahita, for your presentation. It was really cool. Same to Megan. I really enjoyed seeing your guys' presentation. Yeah, thanks to everybody for showing up and watching. It's been really nice to be able to share all the work we've been doing throughout the summer. Kylie, I believe you're muted. Apologies for that. I was just uh, thanking everyone for joining us and th thank you to Lila O. Wilson and Scott Saunders for supporting these fellowship programs. And thank you so much uh, for Pawnee Seed Preservation Society for being here. Uh, uh, the work at the Crane Trust is uh, vital and it takes an all year round effort uh, for this conservation to happen for all kinds of wonderful species to include uh, our beautiful sandhill cranes and whooping cranes and all of the mammals we've looked at tonight, the butterflies, the anurans, the fish. And uh, we wanna thank you all uh, for supporting Crane Trust. If you are members, we greatly appreciate your support so we can continue to protect and maintain the physical, hydrological and biological integrity of the Big Bend area of the Platte River. Uh, as mentioned, this is a vital life support system for whooping cranes, sandhill cranes, bob, bob whites, herons, bobo lynx, killdeer, and all kinds of moths and insects, in addition to the species we mentioned earlier. And if you are not a member of the Crane Trust, we want to invite you to consider membership in addition to uh, many perks and supporting this important conservation effort, uh, you would have access to our virtual program throughout the year. Uh, as mentioned, this vote program has been recorded and we will be sharing it on our YouTube channel. Please keep tabs on us using Facebook and all the social media to stay in touch with our upcoming virtual programs that will take place later in the year. And for now, I want to thank you all. Uh, if any other questions do come in, uh, we will uh, be sure to answer them in the comments when we post this video live. So thank you so much again for being here tonight. And uh, this is all of us to all of you signing off. Thanks again.